Hello, this is Dr. Eric Bricker and thank you for watching A Healthcare Z. Today's topic is 50% of medical treatments have unknown effectiveness. That question mark means unknown. Yes, it's true. So according to a British Medical Journal article from 2013, and the BMJ and the Lancet are like the two premier British European journals. I mean, they're on par with like the Journal of the American Medical Association and the New England Journal of Medicine here. So even though they're not American, like these are this is still a highly reputable journal, okay? And it, in a study from 2013, they looked at 3,000 treatments and they found that 35% of those treatments were actually found to be beneficial or likely to be beneficial. 7% it was kind of a wash. It was a, sort of an equal amounts of benefit and harm. 5% of those treatments were like unlikely to be helpful. And then 3% of those treatments were ineffective or just downright harmful. So the vast majority of them, 50%, it, it was unknown. And these are active treatments, treatments that are actively being used on patients. Okay? It's not saying they're, in, they're, it's not saying they're not effective. It's not saying they're effective. It's just like, we don't know. Okay? So, again, there was another study uh, in the Mayo Clinic Proceedings from 2013 that said that uh, they looked at 10 years of journal articles from the New England Journal of Medicine, again, one of the most prominent journals in the world, and they found that 40% of the time there was a reversal of a previous standard of care in sort of one of these review articles, okay? So in 40% of those articles, they ended up doing a reversal. Okay, that seems awfully high. So let's look at other instances, okay? So in other reviews, 46% had reversals, and in another review, 16% had reversals, which means that, look, treatments, in other words, it's stuff that we're doing, okay? And again, because half of it's like unknown, the point is, is that eventually when they study it more, they're like, oh, we were doing that treatment but now, we just shouldn't do that anymore because we've done more study on it and we found it doesn't do anything, okay? Let's give some specific examples. So, stents, coronary stents for stable coronary artery disease. So these are people that, you know, they were able to walk and exercise, they weren't having any chest pain, but they would do a stress test on them or they would do an angiogram on them and then they would see a narrowing of the arteries and they'd be like, look, I on the angiogram, I see a narrowing, so I'm just going to stent it. Okay, even if the person wasn't having symptoms, they thought that that was the right thing to do. Turns out, not the right thing to do. That's not the standard of care anymore. You treat them with medications, with pills now. Next up, estrogen, I'm sure many of the women watching this video remember this. Estrogen replacement for postmenopausal women. This came out in the early 2000s where this was done to decrease cardiovascular risk, it was used to treat hot flashes, bunch of stuff. Turns out it actually increased cardiovascular and stroke risk. So they, well, we don't give, I mean, we used to give estrogen like water to postmenopausal women. We don't do that anymore. Okay, next up, believe it or not, in the 80s and early 90s, they used to give bone marrow transplants for people with breast cancer. They used to irradiate their bodies and give them such strong chemo that it destroyed their bone marrow. And then they gave them a transplant of bone marrow with the idea being that the cells from the new bone marrow would go out and attack the breast cancer. And there was no evidence for this. It was kind of a theory. And they did like additional studies and they found completely ineffective. And guess what? We don't do bone marrow transplants for breast cancer anymore. Okay, so what is, what's the point of all this? Look, when, I, when a patient is in pain, when they are suffering, when they have fear, and they present to a doctor or a hospital, of course, there is incredible urgency and bias towards doing something. I mean, if something is, I'm not glad because it's funny. I mean, if something is coming to you for help, what are you going to do? You're going to say, well, there's nothing that we can do. The point is, like, of course you try to help them. Now, the point is, is that the medical community and researchers needs to have as much science and data as possible. And if we do things, we shouldn't just, and if they fall into that 50% unknown category, we shouldn't just accept them as that's the way it is. We need to consider, continue studying those things. And if we find data, we need to reverse what we do. Okay, these things were reversed. I guarantee you there are things that are happening now 
that need to be reversed. And look, there are things in that 50% that are highly effective, that are effective, and it just needs to be studied better, again, because it's unknown. Now, there is a cost, and the authors of this article um, say, look, there's a cost. Look, look, uh, this is where a lot of the waste comes from, okay? A lot of the stuff that's unknown, it doesn't work, it's waste. Two, it can jeopardize the patient. You do this stuff, and you can have what's called iatrogenesis, which means you actually harm the patient from a complication from the procedure. So you put in some sort of like external device, or you have surgery, you use a medication, it's unknown. There could be a side effect or a secondary infection, et cetera. You could actually harm the person and cause some sort of additional pain or disability or suffering because of that intervention. That's iatrogenesis. And then finally, it decreases trust. Okay, so what is the, because it's like, okay, you said you were gonna do this, and I believed you that it was gonna work, and then it didn't work. Well, because of 50% of the time, like, you don't really know. Okay, so, so what is the pragmatic advice about this thing? I'm gonna say two things. One, an individual person, including myself, look, I'm gonna make these decisions in conjunction with a primary care physician. Okay, I myself cannot be rational if I'm in a state of pain, suffering, or fear, so you better believe I'm gonna have a primary care physician who's going to like help me through this. I'm not gonna do this on my own, okay? My, no one in my family is gonna do this on their own. I don't recommend that any of you should do this on your own. Okay? Like, second of all, as it relates to COVID, like, I don't see patients, so, like, I'm not going to get vaccinated anytime soon, but if I saw patients, I totally would. And when my time comes up, if it comes up to get vaccinated, I absolutely will get va vaccinated. And more importantly, Dr. Adam Sifu, who is the, the main author, the final author, sort of the boss author of this study from the University of Chicago, he himself has received the coronavirus vaccine. More importantly, so here's the guy who wrote this study about reversals and he himself because at the end of the day it's it's medical decision making is a is a is a is a effort in probabilities is there a probability that it's going to work and is that probability that it's going to work a higher probability than the probability of it's going to harm you okay it's not black and white it's not one or zero the decision making is one of probabilities and so like as it pertains to that i would be in favor of doing it and as it pertains to other things, like that discussion about probabilities needs to be done with somebody who is not in pain and suffering so that you talk about the probabilities for yourself. And that's my point for today. Thank you for watching A Healthcare Scene.